Good evening. Pretty good for a Sunday night crowd. <laughs> it's fantastic to be back here with you all again for my third summer. I'm surprised you've put up with me for this long, um, but I appreciate it nonetheless and the work that we all get to do together as the body of Christ. Um, this picture that's behind the Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16 through 23 passage is of a church in Paris. And this church in Paris is particularly dear to me, and I apologize, it's not Notre Dame. Mainly because there was a fire there last, in 2019, we weren't able to go when I went this past semester. But this is a chapel in Paris, a cathedral called Saint-Chapelle, and it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. Um, I don't have the clicker, so I'm gonna have to request them to click through it real quick. Um, but if you can click to, uh, through the uh, verses real quick, um, there's a title slide. And so this back image right here, if you click over one more slide, you'll see a zoomed out picture of not only the church, but then one more, you'll see this image right here. And this is this huge rose window on the back side of the church as you walk through, incredibly gorgeous as the light cascades in. And if you, yeah, it's kind of hard to see here, but in each individual one of those petals are individual stories from the book of Revelation, specifically on this. If you go back and see the larger image of this chapel, go back one slide, each one of those long panels has stories from an individual book of the Bible. Bible books just all the way around, these stories, these beautiful stained glass images of God's word and his message. And it's so powerful to be in there. It's so intriguing to see and it, it's, you wonder what it would have been like to be a commoner or a peasant when this was first created, going in there and seeing the majesty of all these small pictures. And there's churches like this all across the continent of Europe. I went to so many churches that I was tired of them by the end of it. But each one of these churches has such a deep-rooted legacy, and they're so grand and wonderful the only downside is, is that they miss the point of what the church is entirely. These buildings are beautiful, but it's not nearly as beautiful as the creation of God's church. We're going to talk about that church a bit tonight. Throughout our summer series, we're going to talk about the church and then analyze individual congregations of the Lord's Church in the first century to see how they interacted and how they coped with the growing pressures of becoming God's people. But tonight, I want us to lay out, can you go back to the title slide real quick, the gift of the church. And so we're gonna be, our main passage tonight is from Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one, we're gonna be reading, starting in verse three, all the way to the end of the chapter. And what Ephesians chapter 1 is going to lay out for us, we're going to seek to, to, to find what is the true meaning of the church. What is the church? So before we begin in Ephesians chapter 1, let's talk a little bit about the Greek word itself. The Greek word itself is called ekklesia. You've probably heard of, it, heard of it before. It was a Greek term used in the Athenian democracy all the way back in. And it refers to a, a, a gathering of citizens that have been called out from their homes into an assembly. So you can, you can sort of see it's, it's the people who've been called out into assembly. And that's the word that's first used in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 19. This is the first time it's used by Jesus in this word, the church. It's the passage where he talks about building the founder of the church, the foundation of which the church will be built. And it's this idea of this called out assembly of people. It's the designation of this regular assembly of the body of citizens of the free city state, which was Athens. So knowing this idea of this Greek word that is used for the church, let's jump over to Ephesians chapter one. And as much as I don't want to have to read the whole thing for you, it's just so powerful and poignant that it's, it's worth it. 
All right, beginning in verse three, it says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he, pre he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. Thank you. According to this purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who are in the first to hope in Christ might be the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, and who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. It's so powerful. It's so beautiful, this concept of, the, of, the, of before the even foundation of the world, the church was planned out. The church was planned out. It was predestined that this group of people, this church, and all who join it can come to know salvation in him. Now you can go, I'll go back and click. Oh, that's not it. Um, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 1 through 16 through 23. And as you start thinking about this plan that God has created for us and created for the church, as we read through this end of the chapter, as I click through it, the passage up here will be in the New International Version. I want you to think about the church and how Jesus and that salvation all connects and relates together. Beginning in verse 15, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for those who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That is what the church is. And I want us to look at this passage and pick out little pieces, and we're going to expand on those pieces as we explore God's plan for the church and how we reveal how the church is the end goal of that entire plan. First off, God's people. Let's go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. We're going to start working our way from the very beginning of the Bible, and as Basically, we're going to summarize all the way till the church. I'm going to do it as concisely as possible because you can spend probably eight lifetimes doing this. But beginning in Genesis chapter 3, verses 22, 22 through 24. So this is after the creation. This is after the establishment of the Garden of Eden. And so after this establishment, we have the temptation by the serpent that we see here at the beginning of chapter 3 of the book of Genesis. And as we go through, we start seeing how they begin to sin. And towards the end of the chapter, beginning, let's, let's read verse 22 through 24. So this is after God has come back, after the temptation, after the entrance of sin into the world. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. 
He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. That is the ending of the very beginning of when sin enters into the world. That's when the problem starts, and that's when God's plan kicks into motion. The entrance of sin creates this ever-ending, long-lasting problem. It creates a chasm between God and the people he created. And the rest of the Bible will show how God's love seeks to cross that chasm and not only reach them, but give them a way to travel back, to be in the presence of God. Let's keep moving. Let's move to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And the establishment of Genesis chapter 12 is very interesting because it's the first time we start to see this rejoining of God to his people. Chapter 12 of Genesis chapter 1 is the promise made to Abraham. Beginning of verse 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and to your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so we have the problem of sin, and so now God has reached out to Abram, and he said, on your seed, in your family, everyone will be blessed. This is the beginning of the Israelite nation. Abraham is the seed that starts it all. This is God's plan starting to kick into motion. This is the creation of the Israelites, of God's chosen people. Move to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Exodus chapter 20 builds on this idea. This is right after the exodus out of Egypt. So God has saved his people, the Israelites, out of it, and then he establishes something that's incredibly crucial to understanding the existence of the church and the part of God's plan, and that's the establishment of the old law. Through verses 1 all the way through verse 17, it's the creation of the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are given to Moses on Mount Sinai, the rules that are meant to govern God's chosen people. And it's the solidification of the old law, of the law that's going to govern God's chosen people to allow them to get close to God and allow them to have that personal connection. However, there's a small problem. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 8, verses 6 through 7. Hebrews chapter 8 give us a, a little bit of a light into what is the problem with this old law. Hebrews chapter 8, it says, beginning, I'm going to begin in verse, verses 6, it says, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he meditates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For that if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And if you look here, there's a passage in verses 8 through 12. There's a prophecy from the Old Testament. It comes from Jeremiah chapter 31. And it's there in Jeremiah chapter 31 that they talk about the establishment of a new covenant. Why is there a problem with the Old Covenant? There's no complete removal of of sins. It doesn't completely close the chasm. It's like a, 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 a misshapen kind of haphazard bridge that kind of pulls it together. And it works, but it doesn't work permanently. It rolls over the sins. There's a concept called the Day of Atonement that was established. You can read about it in Leviticus. This Day of Atonement was once a year the, most, the high priest would enter the most holy place and would offer a sacrifice of atonement that would roll the sins over of the Israelite people for that year. And so the sins will be rolled over and rolled over and rolled over, but there is no permanent elimination of all sins. That's the imperfection that's in the Old Testament. But watch how God uses this to make something even more perfect. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and Matthew chapter 28 detail the final sacrifice 
and the establishment of the new law. If you read beginning in verse 32, you begin to read the account of the crucifixion. I'm going to hop in at verse 37, and it says, And over his head they put the charge against him which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And if you jump down through, go down to verse 46, it says, And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. So they go and they get the sour wine. They give it to him to drink. But in verse 50 we read, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now I want you to notice the next couple of verses. Once Jesus' death happens, verse 51, and behold the curtain of the temple, the temple, the place where the Israelites would come and they would worship God, an epicenter for the old law. The curtain of the temple that separated the most holy place from the rest of the temple, what happens to it? It's torn in two, top to bottom. The earth earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs are open. And many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep are raised. And look at the first person who notices this new establishment. It's not even an Israelite. But look at how he responds when he sees the overwhelming power of Jesus and the coming of this new kingdom. Verse 54, it's a centurion who was watching over Jesus, and he sees everything. And he says, truly, this was the Son of God. That's the power that Jesus comes in. And when he comes and he dies as that sacrifice, he presents the eternal, everlasting solution to the problem of sin that we read about all the way back in Genesis. He erases it. But not only does his death erase it, he doubles down. In, verse, in chapter 28, we read about how he rises again. And when he rises again, he not only has eliminated with his death, but he has now created a figurehead. And as Ephesians chapter 1 tells us, when he rises, he begets, he becomes raised from the dead in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. And he's seated at the right hand of in the heavenly realms. And once he's done that, he's now what? What does Ephesians 1 tell us? He tells us that he's the head over everything for the church. So Jesus' resurrection has not only eliminated the problem of sin, his crucifixion and his resurrection, that ultimate sacrifice that he made, now establishes the church. Flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, and it's here in 1 Peter that Peter illustrates so beautifully what the church is. And you'll notice these small tidbits that reference back to the nation of Israel and how the church is a fulfillment of this whole entire plan, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Humanity who went away intentionally to follow their own desires, was separated on their own choosing from the God that loved them so much. And he went out of his way to offer that excellent and amazing mercy that Peter tells us about and that we see in Matthew chapter 27 and 28. And the culmination of all of that is us. We are that chosen race. We are that royal priesthood, that holy nation, 
a people for God's own possession so that we can proclaim the excellencies of him. Flip over to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. We'll continue doubling down on this idea of the power of Jesus and how Jesus is the, he's everything. He's everything to the church. He's everything to us. Verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. I want you to notice Jesus' power. He's everything, and he's everything to the church. And notice, cross-reference between Colossians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 1, you start realizing these similar concepts of power that Paul talks about. And one of the most beautiful ideas that I think is very apt to close on with this tonight, to understand about the church, is this idea of all of the fullness of God. If you read Ephesians chapter 1, Again, the end of Ephesians chapter 1 in the English Standard Version, it says, this beginning of verse 22, And he put him, put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. This ever-present, this ever-powerful, penetrating power of God that is given to us, that should embolden us, that should motivate us, that we know that that power is given to us as the result of a massive plan that God made from the very beginning in order to reconcile us. What great love is that? Throughout the rest of this summer, we're gonna look at some of those churches who appreciated and saw that love, and we're gonna break down how they dealt with it, some of the issues that they had, so that we can learn more about them and learn how they can teach us and how what they did can we can reflect to ourselves. If you haven't felt that love, you can feel it tonight. You can feel it with every single one of the members of this church. You can be part of God's great plan of love. If you need anything, please come as we stand and as we sing.